What's up guys, George Camel here, and today I am bringing together two of the biggest names in the weird little world of personal finance YouTubers. Three if you count me, which no one ever seems to do. I think I need a hug. That's right, I'm hanging out in person with Jaspreet Singh, host of the Minority Mindset YouTube channel, which has over 1.7 million subscribers. Not only that, we have paired him with the one, the only Humphrey Yang, a viral TikTok influencer and YouTuber with over a million subscribers. Now, the three of us, we mostly agree on things related to money, but there are things we disagree on. So I thought it would be fun to try a new segment on this channel called Agree to Disagree. And I thought correctly, it was fun. You don't wanna miss it. But before we get started, help me catch up with these two titans of the trade and get our numbers up. So hit those like, subscribe, and share buttons so I too can one day become a titan. We're hanging out with Jaspreet Singh and Humphrey Yang, two of the great financial YouTubers of our time. Guys, welcome. Thank you for having us. You guys are meeting for the first time today, is that correct? We are. This is true. I feel like a magician being like, you've never met this person before. This is fun, uh, especially because we come from very uh, diverse backgrounds with different financial philosophies. But what's cool is that um, we all have heritage from the East origin. Is that a good way to say it? That's a right? appropriate way to say like it, we're yes. All, we're all yes. first generation Americans. Yeah, correct. Is that how that works? Yeah. yeah. Where are your parents from? Uh, China and Taiwan. Okay. Yeah. Just brief. Uh, Northwest India, state called Punjab. Nice. And then my family, of course, Egypt and Syria. Obviously. So we're representing uh, most of Asia today because Syria is in Asia. Can you guys confirm? I will confirm that. Well, I thought because we have uh, mostly the same financial philosophy, but a little bit different, I thought we'd play a game called Agree to Disagree. Here's how it works. We have paddles, and I'm gonna say a financial statement. And if you agree, give it a thumbs up. If you disagree, give it a thumbs down. And then we're gonna explain our answers, our caveats, our objections. You may go like, yes, but, and that's okay. But you have to land somewhere. We gotta, you know, draw a line in the sand at some point. All right. You guys agreeing to play this game? I agree. Oh. Yes. You must yes. agree contractually. Okay. <laughs> Here we go, guys. Yes, I did sign away it's all the yes, grades. but answer to start with. <laughs> this guy, this is not going well already. Uh. A good credit score equals good money management. All right, we got two disagrees, one agree. Do we fight him now? How does this work? <laughs> yeah, let's fight him. Okay, what's your thoughts on this? Good credit score equals good money management. Why do you disagree? Oh, I disagree because credit is a measure of looking at how you pay off debt generally. And uh, I, I like what uh, the Ramsey philosophy is on that when it comes to credit. Your credit score is a, kind of a, just a made-up number. It doesn't really mean anything. I know people with that really brag their 800 credit scores with lots of debt and no wealth to show for it. A good credit score doesn't necessarily mean anything about wealth. I wholeheartedly agree. Humphrey, you disagree. I don't State disagree with that statement, which is that a good credit score has nothing to do with wealth. I definitely agree with that. However, I think if you have a good credit score, it means you're typically good at paying off your debts, at least on time. So I think it does take some financial discipline to do that, and many people can't do that, and that's why they have a bad credit score. So back to your original statement, I think having a good credit score means that you probably have somewhat of a decent money management system, although if you're still in debt, you know, that's another question. Okay, speaking from a man who is debt-free. That's true. So yeah, I see this as the credit score is about debt management, not necessarily money management. Because like you said, you could be technically broke while paying your debts off perfectly mm -hmm. on time. All of that. Here we go. The best way to build wealth is to invest in a 401k. Why are you disagreeing with me on this one? I thought, I thought we could have a win. I thought we could have a family win today. Don't ever go against the family, Jerry. Uh, I don't think it's the best way to build, build wealth, only because I feel like the 401k is a type of forced savings account. And I think that if you really want to build wealth, you have to build above and beyond the 401k. And I do think that a 401k offers you a lot of tax advantages. It offers you a match. If you can get that match, it's free money. However, in order to build true wealth that's going to last you perhaps your lifetime or the next generation, you kind of have to go above and beyond that. So I think just investing in a 401k isn't enough. I think you got to do a little bit more. Hot take. Hot take. All right. Just bring. I would agree. I think for anybody who aspires to become wealthy, 401k is one of the worst ways that you can go. Because 
when you put your money into a 401k, you lose control. Your money is tied up with Wall Street for a number of years. They're going to take a percentage of your money no matter what. Yeah, you might get some tax benefits, but you can get way better tax benefits, I'm telling you, as an attorney, who's not your attorney, <laughs> by not investing your money into this 401k. This is not law advice. If you want tax benefits, go and put your money into rental real estate, and now you can get a lot of tax benefits, and now you control your money, you can access your money, and you have way more ability to invest your money into other types of assets as well. Juicy. All right, I'll give you my take. I think for the average American who can't afford rental real estate, I would only tell them to buy investment property with cash. That's a hot take on its own. But with the 401k, we did our millionaire study, over 10,000 of them, and we found that 80% said the 401k was the vehicle that helped them get there. And so to your point where you were saying, hey, I think it's gonna be really hard to build wealth, with 401k, you know, the limit per year, no one's maxing out their 401k. Mm -hmm. We tell people to invest 15% of their income into tax advantage retirement accounts as a baseline. And we found that if they do that, they're going to build wealth. Now, they may not build $10 million in a 401k, but can they build $2 million, $3 million in that nest egg over their working career? I think so. And so I think for the average person, it's a great tool that is underutilized and people aren't investing enough. So I think if we have the savings rate up, you can absolutely build a solid nest egg there to help you out in retirement. It's smart to pay off your house as soon as possible. We have our first win, guys. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. This is controversial. Yeah. This is a controversial take in the financial world. A lot of people, when I tell them this on social media, they will harangue me in the comments going, if you have a low interest rate mortgage, you're stupid to pay it off early. Why are they wrong? Yeah, so I think that psychologically, it's a huge win. And I think when you don't have any debt, it frees you up to maybe try something more risky in your own life. Perhaps you have more options, more flexibility. I think if you can just pay it off in full whenever you can, it's going to be, it's going to free you up so much mentally. And I think I value that peace of mind over anything. Mm. Good I'll take. Like I like to look at the home that you live in as a liability. It is not an asset. And the reason why is because, so as a, I'm a licensed realtor and I don't practice now, but when I used to, the big sales pitch as a realtor is you're buying your biggest investment of your life. It is the biggest purchase you're ever going to make. So now when is the best and biggest investment you're ever going to make? What are you going to do? You're going to buy a little bit bigger. I want more. And so now what happens? You keep buying into this big money pit. And now every time something goes wrong, you got to pay out of your pocket to fix it. Every time something bad happens, you got to pay out of pocket to fix it. And you think that you're building wealth, but in reality, it's just money going into this black hole until hopefully you can sell it for a profit. And I was starting investing in real estate after the 2008 crash. And so I saw firsthand that real estate prices go up and down. Mm. And when you understand that, it's going to help you realize that, oh, maybe this invisible number, this invisible equity could go away someday. And when you keep living off of that invisible equity by pulling cash out and spending it, which is what a lot of people like to do, you're playing a very risky game. Good takes. Yeah, and I, I like the idea of when you pay off your mortgage, you have freed up that payment to now invest and you reduced your largest fixed expense. And so you're right. I don't see it as a, a cash flowing asset because it's your primary home. You're not making money off this thing. It's going to cost you money. But reducing that payment is going to help you build wealth faster. And we recommend investing while paying off the home. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big caveat. People think I'm not investing and instead I'm putting all that money towards the home. I'm still investing for the future but I want to get rid of that mortgage. And it feels good. The best per, the best interest rate I found is 0% on that mortgage. And that's what you get with a paid off home. Hey, we'll get back to the conversation in just a second. But real quick, let me tell you guys about Delete Me. Delete Me removes your personal info from hundreds of data broker websites. In fact, they found and removed data about me from over 500 sites. And they sent me an easy to read report outlining what they did. And right now, you can get a one-year plan for less than nine bucks a month to help keep your personal info off the web and away from shady weirdos pretending to be you. So go to joindeleteme.com slash George for 20% off, or just click the link in the description. Agree or disagree, if you want extra guac, get extra guac. If you can afford it. If you can afford it. Is that a caveat, or is this, does it matter if you can afford it or not? Hey, I said what I said. Right, well, I said what I said, too. I know this is this is big for you. Where does your it's, it's one of your taglines. 
afford the uh, afford the guac. It is. Yeah, get the guac, baby. Get the guac. But you gotta afford the guac. See, mm. here's the thing, right? <laughs> One does not simply obtain the guac. One it must costs money. afford the guac. It costs money to, to get the land, to grow the avocados. It takes time to see the trees grow. It takes money and time to, to get the avocados off of the tree to then make it into guac. Now, if you want that guac, good, go out and earn it. But you got to afford the guac before you go on and buy the guac. Mm. Don't go into credit card debt to buy guac, even if it's at Chipotle. Come on, people. What a beautiful journey of the avocado you just right? walked us through. <laughs> that was beautiful. We can do a whole like episode on guac. Something I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> sorry. Tell us about your guac in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's your guac like in San Fran? It, the avocados are pretty good from California. So I don't know. They're, they're, they're good. They're, I don't you know, know where they're grown? You got a local guy? No, but, you know, I, I get the Produce is good in California. Yeah, the produce is good. Oh, oh, you guys have nice uh, farmer's markets yeah. out there, man. Yeah. Great farmer's market. How's the avocado Ooh. in Detroit? We get ours from California. Okay, smart. <laughs> good move. Good move. Probably same here in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> Agree or disagree, no lying. Everyone should be making a monthly budget. Agree or disagree? These are my budget bros right here. Let's go, man. Let's go, budget bros. Did we just become best friends? Yup. Okay, this word has gotten a bad rap. A lot of financial creators out there have kind of dogged the budget to be uh -huh. like countercultural. Like, budgets are stupid. Buy what you want. Use my spending <laughs> method. I think a budget is that just, is a budget, it's just right? an intentional yeah, spending plan. Yeah, exactly. It's just not spending willy-nilly. It's going, do I have the money? Is this a priority? Can I cover all my bills and things that matter to me before I go spend? Yeah, I like where every, I like knowing where every dollar is going to go and then having a little roll for each dollar and then knowing that if I have some left over, I can spend it on whatever I want. So I love that. That's why we call our budgeting app every dollar. Wow, see? Boom. Big brain thoughts. How about you? What it, I can't, I don't think I can add more to what you guys said. Wow. We've left Jaspreet speechless. Spouses should have separate checking accounts for his and her spending. Agree or disagree? <gasps> oh. Now, to clarify, do you have a spouse? I don't have a spouse. <laughs> okay. I think that matters in this discussion. I think that's a good point. But state your case here. So if You're I, saying, hey, Humphrey gets his spending account, she gets her spending account, then we have one joint for bills. Is that how you see it? Sure, yeah. And why is that? I feel like if I were to marry a, a person with similar values that I wouldn't even have to worry about what goes on in her spending. Um, obviously, I don't have a spouse, so I don't know. But, but you know, ladies, eligible bachelor. <laughs> and also, in my head, I was just thinking, man, one day I'm just going to make so much money. It doesn't matter how much my wife spends. So. All I heard was, if you marry Humphrey, unlimited spending is yours. Mm. So My DMs are open. <laughs> the DMs are open. How you doing? What do you think about this? <laughs> I think, yeah, do whatever's right for you as a couple. But for me, because I can only speak for myself, uh, my wife and I have one bank account. It's really just a matter of understanding. Um, my wife knows she can kind of buy whatever she wants, but doesn't, just out of respect. Like, you know, even if it's a $3,000 handbag is not a big purchase for us, fortunately. We're very fortunate for that. But she doesn't go out and just do that on impulse. So I think it's more of an understanding on a relationship more than just a financial side, because if you're marrying this person, you guys are sharing everything. I think you should be on the same page financially as well. I like that. Yeah, the way I see it, to your point, Humphrey, people think if there's only one checking account, it's going to cause some friction, restriction on spending. But my wife and I have one bank account, and then we have a budget. And together, there's a line item for Whitney spending, Georgia spending. And mm -hmm. so we talk about that ahead of time and go, here's how much you get to spend without, you know, my judgment, as long as there's nothing morally wrong with it. And uh, luckily... We have very similar values, and she's not impulsive and doing sure. crazy things. But I think it frees you to go, no, 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 Humphrey has $300 he gets to spend on whatever he wants this month and enjoy that. So I found that there creates transparency and trust in the relationship when you have one account. All right, this next one is ripe because you guys are in this room. Having immigrant parents is a financial advantage, agree or disagree? All right, All right, let's hear the stories. Well, I think when you have immigrant parents, what that means generally is you get to see the real value of hard work. You get to really appreciate the value of a dollar. Although I didn't grow up with like the financial education of investing, I learned the value of hustle, the value of working hard, the value of kind of doing whatever it takes and not complaining about it and being able to appreciate 
what you have, the opportunities you have here. Because when you come from an immigrant family, why did your parents come to this country? They came because there's better opportunity here than there is there. And so when you grow up in a country where your parents came with nothing, you really have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Mm. I like that take. How about you, Humphrey? Yeah, I agree a lot with Jess Breed here. I think it instills all these values in you that, uh, you know, perhaps the average American family might not if they're already, if they're not, if you're not first generation. You know, they came here for an opportunity and I don't want to like let that be squandered away with my choices. And so I think I got a lot of good financial habits from my parents as well. And so, yeah, I definitely agree. Let's go. I love it. Yeah, I think there's a natural sense, there's a common sense frugality Forget, with yeah. immigrants yeah. because they came with less and there's more opportunity here. And there's almost this gratefulness and lack of entitlement that I oh, find yeah. with immigrants. They're not scared of work. They never think something's going to be handed to them. And I think that creates more wealth if handled correctly. Now, of course, there's immigrant stories where they are deeply in consumer debt, trying to live a lifestyle, impress people, whatever. But for the most part, I found immigrants have this innate sense of, I'm not going to out-earn out my stupidity. I'm going to live on less than I make. Buying a home is better than renting a home. Ugh. Oh, I'm, can we do this? Oh, yeah, I'm pretty much like there. Big caveats. I think uh, by the time you die, yes. Mm -hmm. Right now, no matter what, no. Agreed. I'm on board with Is you. that fair? Yeah, I'll go yep. with you on that. Same. Buying a home when you're broke is a terrible idea. 100%. Like when you're drowning in debt payments, you got nothing down, and you're just buying because of the pressure. Terrible. Yep. But is a home a solid asset? And like we said, paying off that mortgage, getting rid of your fixed expense versus rent continuing to go up? I think it's wise to eventually be a homeowner. But depending on your situation, your city, the cost of living, it doesn't make sense for everyone just to go buy. Yeah. It's smart to have an investing pro in your corner as you build wealth. Investments only, or? I said what I said. It's smart to have an investing pro in your corner as you build wealth. Does pro mean they're paid? It's just a professional. We didn't talk about how they're paid. Well, they could also be the pro themselves, right? You could be standing in your corner as your own pro. I am not qualified for that. Sure. If you're if you're Humphrey and Jaspreet, easy for you guys to say. No, as go. financial prodigies. If you're paying a financial advisor, I would go this for investment advice. You but don't think not, professionals should be paid for their services, is what you're saying? Not for not financial advisors for investing advice, no. Okay. I think it's wise over time as you build wealth, especially serious wealth. Things get more complicated. You want to be strategic when it comes to tax planning and charitable giving and, mm -hmm. and even just having that person to walk you through, give you perspective, help you understand things. They're knee deep in this stuff every day versus the average person who's not in the financial space. I will add on that that's okay because of how you said it changes over time. I do agree. I think as, as your wealth accumulates, you're going to want to lean on more professionals when, when appropriate. And you guys, do you work with any pros or are you the pros? So you're like, I don't, I'm not, it's not necessary for me. You used to I be a financial pro. advisor. I am the pro. So again, he's working with the pro. I don't have a financial advisor. I work with, I manage my own money. This guy is, he does it all. <laughs> Lawyer, real estate agent. Well, what have you pursued? I don't you work as an attorney. I got that degree from my parents, immigrant parents. Where, <laughs> so I got that for them. So if you didn't go to law school, would your parents find you, uh, you know, would, would they be disappointed in you? Even well, with your success today? Well, the reason I went to law school is because I disappointed them. I didn't become a doctor. Oh, so doctor's number one. Doctor was number one. Lawyer's like, you're kind of a failure. Lawyer was a failure. Oh my Not gosh. Kind of. It was, God you have to bless. become a doctor or be a failure. And when they found out that I wasn't going to be a doctor, they were like, you have to at least become an attorney to keep some pride in the family. Was the there resentment there? Because if I, law school's no joke. Like to go through all of that to appease family, would it would hurt my soul a little bit, if I'm going to be honest. For me? Um... I don't know. I wanted to make my parents happy. It was a respect thing. It was a respect thing. Okay. I think we kind of, they knew that I didn't want to, but I think in their eyes, it was at least you'll have some protection. or You like can some, fall back fall on this back terrible on suck bar career of, right, of being exactly. a lawyer. So at least you'll have something to fall back on. Wow. All right. Agree or disagree? I would spend over $500 on an item just because of nostalgia. This might be something you've done, but would you? Spend over 500 bucks on an item because of nostalgia. All right. Is there an item in mind? Like, what would you be willing? For me, it'd be like a concert or something like that yeah. where, you know, I want to relive oh, some sort of experience point. or, 
I might have to change my answer now. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of anything. But if something I really wanted and I can afford it and it's not breaking my budget, sure, why not, right? You, if you have that ability in your budget to buy something, whether it's stupid or not, as long as you, got, you can afford the stupid purchase, that's fine. If you could light that money on fire and not miss it too much, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like I spent the biggest, con- the most expensive concert I went to was uh, over the summer and it was to see Blink-182. Mm. And it was like over 300 bucks and included like all you can eat, food and drink. It was, you know, solid, but that like hurt my stomach to spend that much. But that was nostalgia for me. Mm-hmm. But if you can afford it, right? That's the big thing, right? If you didn't have $300 to spend and you put it on your credit card, then it's a, a yep. red thumbs down. I like that. That's a, okay, you guys changed I, I my like mind. That. Yeah. I revert to green. Boom. It is better to invest in real estate than the stock market. Agree or disagree? Ah, this is a tricky one. See, I'll give. I can only speak for myself, right? I, can't I can speak only for speak for myself I can too. Only speak for myself. Oh, yeah, this is tough. I'll, I'll go. So for you, just Breit, real estate has been better than stock market. It's for me, I understand it more. I like the thing that I can see, feel, and touch. I understand it. I built an amazing team in real estate. So there are people that have become incredibly wealthy in the stock market without ever touching real estate. There are people that have become incredibly wealthy in the real estate market without ever touching stocks. I don't care which one you pick. I do both, but I, I personally prefer real estate over stocks. That's strong. I like what you said there. And it's we always say invest in what you understand. Yeah. If you don't like real estate, you don't understand it, don't just go buying property because you heard it was a good oh, yeah. hack to wealth. How yeah. about you? I personally don't own any real estate yet. I'd like to get into the real estate game by buying my own home or perhaps an investment property down the line. But for now, I just have stocks. And, you know, to be honest, both are assets that appreciate over time, mm-hmm. hopefully, with, with real estate. And um, as long as you have some sort of assets that have some leverage, I think that's more important than not investing at all, right? So Yeah. Well, I've yeah. seen people who, they have rental property, and their cash flow is so minimal or it's in the negative. We, I took mm, this call sure. yesterday in the Ramsey show. They are losing money. They're mm. paying money to own this real estate property. And I'm like, if you sold that and just put it in an index fund, you would make more money than your rental makes. And so I think in some scenarios, it's just like, you got to think through this a smart way. And so I like paid for real estate. That's going to okay. cash flow a heck of a lot better than highly leveraged mortgage real estate that's barely cash flowing. So that's my take. Yes. I don't think one is truly better than Two. another. You know, uh, yeah, it was a little bit of a trick. Taking out student loans as a good investment in one's future. Agree or disagree? You didn't have student loans. No. Did you have student loans? I did not. Wow. Am I the only one? Good for me. But is it though? People have gotten crazy thinking it's good debt. That's the term I hear. It's There's ROI on a degree. Therefore, take out unlimited student loans to make it happen. You'll make more over your career. Yeah, But I think it holds people back financially into adulthood and stunts their growth and wealth. Well, I'll tell you from my perspective, because I started uh, when I was in college, that was when I started my uh, first business. It was a party promotion business. I didn't party, I didn't drink, but I saw how much money people were blowing on partying and drinking. And well, There's an opportunity. Absolutely. And, and the crazy thing is, it's, yeah, well, from my perspective, what I saw was a lot of kids deep in student loans who are spending money like crazy. You know, you go and get the exotic apartment you don't have cheap apartments. Like when we were in college, a lot of them are now bougie, very luxury. nice, very luxury apartments that are very expensive. 19, 20, 21 year old, you're buying bottle service with money you don't have, looking like you're Rick Ross when you're not making any money. And you don't even look like Rick Ross. <laughs> you don't look like He Rick looks Ross. great now. Have you seen him? Yeah, He's lost man. a lot of weight. So it's, it, it, the thing is, I, th- I think student loans can be okay. I'm not opposed to them, but there has to be a path to monetization. Right, which means if I want to be a doctor because I want to be a doctor and you need student loans to get there, fine. But just like anything else, then shop around. Don't go to the most expensive school just because it's got a name. There's there's ways for you to mitigate the amount of loans you get that way you can get the best ROI. Think of it like a financial decision. Think of it like a business. All right. Uh, agree or disagree, I own a tuxedo. I'm trying to think if I own one. You know good and well if you own a tuxedo. I do own one, yes. Wow. I would have not, I th- would have thought <laughs> Jaspreet is the tux man. I thought this guy's been to a black tie formal event. Look at him. Here's, Look at my, us. here's my thought, okay? <laughs> Every time it costs to rent a tuxedo, it's about $250 for me, right? See what? I'm just going to buy one. So I bought a tuxedo, it was $800, and I've already been to two weddings with that for a Let's black go. tie one. So, you know, if I go to one more wedding in my life, I break even. Invite then, him to a wedding so we can ROI, guys. What are you doing? <laughs> Help a brother out. 
How about you? No, no tux. As far as I know, a lot know, of suits, but no tux. A lot of suits. Uh, if you guys need a suit, come by to Detroit. We got some amazing wow. suit stores. You out got there. a suit guy? I got a suit guy, and I'm paying very. This one right here, maybe 185 bucks, wow. three piece. No way. Yeah. So. I got to see your suit guy. Agree or disagree? Yep. Everyone should have cryptocurrency in their investment portfolio. Everyone? Wow. So turns out you don't think crypto is so great, Humphrey. <laughs> well, well, I have some in mind, but I don't think everyone should have some. Why is that? Because everyone's at different ages in their life. Let's say you're 60 years old. Do you need cryptocurrency in, with your <laughs> retirement coming up soon? Probably not. But uh, I think if you want to add a little bit of speculation into your portfolio, I think two to five percent. A in little your speculation is fine. spice. Speculation spice. But you even know. you're calling it speculation. That is. Slightly. I've gotten dogged for calling it that. So here's the thing: it is quite speculative, but it's also been the best returning asset since 2010, whenever it was created, right? In terms of percentage. So it's like, might as well have a little bit in there just in case. All right. Um, I call it schmuck insurance. Oh. <laughs> so I don't feel like an idiot if it goes up to like 100000 per Bitcoin. It's kind of but, the FOMO of like, dang it, I yeah. should have got in when it was hot, man. Yeah, but I'm okay if you don't have it at all, too. I mean, you all can right. live a great life without it. You're not going to hurt Humphrey's have. feelings. You're not going to hurt my feelings. All right, what's your take on this? Don't make your investment portfolio a speculative portfolio, right? Make a speculative investment the speculative piece of your portfolio. Make it a small piece of your portfolio and have some fun with those things, whether it's crypto, whether it's something else, maybe whatever it might be. So find what's right for you. I like that. Yeah, I, I'm not mad at crypto. I just think people need to first be investing into those index funds and mutual funds and retirement plans before they go throwing money into these speculative things. It's like buying a boat. It's, you know, well, it's a toy. Agree or disagree, I prefer spending money on experiences over things. Oh, yeah. Oh, We're not agree. thing people. I think everyone has a phase of, they, of you like stuff, but you realize once you have the stuff after three months, you, you revert back to normal and yeah. everything's the same again. So really experiences are what brings me fulfillment and I'd rather have a good experience over and something to remember, some nostalgia, if you will, yeah. over a piece of clothing or an article of jewelry. I agree. Um, I've been very fortunate that after my wife and I got married, we were able to travel and see many different parts of the world and live in different parts of the world, which was so cool. And you get to see different cultures and different people, even within the United States. Like Nashville is very different than San Fran. It's very different than Detroit. Well, just like that, the United States is very different than Europe. And the way that European countries operate is very different. So just seeing that was a very cool experience. Yeah. I think I, as you get older, you start to shift towards experience. Last one. We're ending on a juicy note. Mm. Credit cards cause you to spend more than you would with a debit card. Agree or disagree? Say for the average person. You are above average, I assume. No, I would say just for the average person who doesn't uh, keep a budget, let's say, they might feel tempted to spend more on a credit card because mm. they have that limit available to them. Fair point. And you disagreed? I, I mean, I agree with what you're saying, but I think now if you can control your spending, your credit card is just a medium of exchange. So if once you can get that mindset of I know what I'm spending and I'm not going to overspend and my credit card is just a trans, a tool to make that transaction, it's not going to change how you spend your money. If it is, you got to stop using a credit card. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we know the stats on how many people actually are able to pay off their card every month. And there's new studies that I found interesting. I put this in my book in the credit cards chapter. MIT did a study with fMRI technology and they scanned the brain at the point of, of swiping that card. And they found that it, not only releases the brakes, uh, but it also hits the accelerator on spending, which was fascinating to mm -hmm. me. And so that was a really interesting way to look at it. When it hurts less, it costs more. When there's less friction, when it's not your money, like your brain knows, eh, it's, I'll pay it, but it's not my money right now leaving my bank. I think the more friction and pain we can bring back and discomfort when it comes to spending, the better off we'll be. And that's why I like the debit card even over the credit card. Mm -hmm. now, I do think cash is the most pain. Right, cash is the No matter money. where you're spending. But even with a debit card, you know that's my money being spent now versus someone else's money I have to pay back later. So that's my take. Well, guys, it's been such a pleasure having you on. Humphrey, where can people find you if they want to learn more and follow you? Uh, Humphrey Yang on YouTube and Humphrey Talks on Instagram and TikTok. Love it. Thank you. And just free. Uh, Minority Mindset on YouTube and socials. And you can also check out Briefs Media, briefs.co, where we have free newsletters and a bunch of cool financial news and education content. Well, you guys are doing amazing work helping people 
build wealth, avoid traps out there, and you both have amazing channels. So there's there's room for all of us in this space, and it's an honor to know you guys. Thank you for being here. It's having Thanks for having us. us. Listen, that's as much fun as you can have legally. I had a great time, and I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as we enjoyed making it. Huge thanks to Jaspreet and Humphrey for playing along and hanging out with me today. And if you liked this video, check out this one where I started a really awkward fight between Graham Stephan and Jack Selby. It's worth a click. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.